Saint Benedict, Holy Benedict, Benedict of Nursia is a character in the story of Christendom in the general West or in the Roman area. We don't know much about him in Ethiopia, but I think he's someone that we could learn from a great deal. He's a very, very early saint or holy man. And so prior to a lot of the distancing that comes about from the schisms, he gets close to us. Now, just being frank, he is a man who was born after Chalcedon in 451. And so after what we would call the original Great Schism. And so he is technically, not officially, probably recognized in our communion known as the Miaphysite or Oriental Communion, which I more lovingly refer to linguistically or philologically as the Afro-Asiatic Communion, right? Armenia and India, Antioch and Alexandria, Ethiopia and Eritrea. So that being the case, I think there's a lot we could learn from him, especially as English speakers. And I watched recently part of the Pivotal Player series in the Catholic Church by Bishop Robert Barron. He's a man I've been following since he was a priest. He's a local bishop here in Los Angeles where, where I'm based and my ministry mostly happens, uh, except for the digital ministry, of course. And he's the auxiliary bishop of Los Angeles in the Catholic jurisdiction, if I'm not mistaken. And he has just phenomenal book reviews and film reviews. So he really speaks to the culture. He engages the culture at the same time. He prevents, uh, he presents and publishes works of what he calls the pivotal players in the Roman Catholic tradition, as well as ancient people like St. Benedict, as well as more recent people like Thomas Merton and all the people in between. He's also got his own commentary on second Samuel, which I want to get to. He's got a book on the, the ghost eater phenomenon, the death eater phenomenon, or the, the pedophilia ring in the Catholic church. And I have a few copies of that. If anyone knows me personally, you could reach out. And as long as I have copies available and you're willing to pull up on me, I could give you a free version of, of that book. He's also got a book, again, on speaking and engaging the culture, Seeds of the Church, that I have. He, he, just, he just is so prolific in terms of video, audio, everything. And I watched recently in honor, because on July 11th is the feast in the Roman Rite of St. Benedict. So in, in honor of this great man, I said, let me learn a little bit more about him. And I watched his short one-hour documentary, which is available for free right now, of somewhere with the Word of Fire ministry. If you go look them up, do your work there, you could find it for free and after. It's probably available on DVD for purchase. But there were some things I took away from this that I really appreciate. The big thing is that monasticism is this workshop of the virtues where you get to think about and do or practice and tinker with the various virtues and and live a life that gets you closer and closer to christ he describes this main text of saint benedict called the rule which i am now invited to go read on my own i found a quick translation online it's here about what 32 pages very interesting, just for those who are interested in church history, those who are interested in, in learning about the various traditions, it's good to reach out and find the primary sources, the original texts of Christians of various times and various places, so that you can see, as C.S. Lewis says in his introduction to Athanasius of Alexandria, Athanasius the Great's great text on the incarnation he says in there read texts from various centuries switch off read something from your century then read something from another century read something from different places so that you could see what biases are specific to your time and your place and what biases are specific to other times and other places and then what is the universal message of christ across time and place which is an assumption we have as members of christendom so the Rule by St. Benedict is something I plan on reading, and I encourage all of you to go read it yourselves. In it, Father B uh, Bishop Barron, rather, he says that it talks of the monarchy of the abbot. The abbot is the head of a monastic community, and in this context, it's Holy Benedict. And the abbot is kind of uh, an absolute monarch, but one who is bound by textual tradition, by, by the scriptures and by the writings of the fathers, by the rule of law presented by love, 
that is taught by God for us to love God fully and to love our neighbors and especially those neighbors who happen to be or appear to be strangers and enemies. And within this monarchy of the abbot, you have four uh, you, you have you have four types of monasticism and the monarchy of the abbot rule that commands a community is the best one in the view of holy benedict but you also have the idea of being a hermit those monks who decide to live by themselves in the wilderness which is explored you have the idea of a community that has no abbot so kind of an, an anarchic community of monks who just decide to live together who don't necessarily have a common rule everybody's observing their own rules and then you have the monks who wander from place to place this was fascinating to me because there have been people in the ethiopian communities who speak about the various monks of north america and, and talk about the communities in ethiopia versus in, in the cops often parishes in coptic communities are led by married priests whereas I've seen very many monks involved in, in the parish life here in the United States of uh, Ethiopian communities. And typically monastics are, are very close to this Benedictine rule where they should be living in community and be obedient to whoever their abbot is rather than wandering around various parishes and uh, rather than being in a community that is headless, that has no head, that has no abbot. And, and we still have hermits nowadays, too. I actually don't see or know of any communities that are monks that have no abbot. But I do know of hermits today. They're called Bahatawian in our tradition. And I do know about wandering priests today, which I see again in North America across different parishes. And I also know about traditional monasteries in Ethiopia that have a head, that have an abbot who's running the show, who's, who's having their spiritual sons do what what they're telling them to do in terms of liturgy in terms of hard labor and work and and there's this beauty in occupying your time so that you're not idle the american saying goes something to the effect of idle hands do the devil's work an amharic saying that is similar is uh, or more recently so an, an open mind or an idle mind is like a cave for Satan to enter or the updated version. It's like a garage for him to park his car in. So in, in either way, whether it's the Amharic sayings or the English sayings, this idea of idleness to be avoided and productivity, uh, the idea of being prolific in the production of you know, if your monastery is selling coffee or making beer or making clothes or candles or producing uh, psalmody music or <clears throat> copies of the, of the Psalms text or writing commentaries on scripture or producing commentary on liturgies, just being productive, being prolific as a way of keeping God in our thoughts so that he stays on our lips and in our deeds and actions. I think that's enough of a review for you to go check out the Pivotal Players series of Bishop Robert Barron and his Word on Fire series, especially regarding St. Benedict or Holy Benedict. And read The Rule of St. Benedict.